Okay. That is all rocking. Let's give it another minute or two here and we'll get we'll get going. The last bit of people get in here. Okay. Oh. Nice little background you got there. What's that? Head? Nice little background you got there. Yeah, we just uh, we kind of set up green screens. So I just put it in my office so you can't see the rest of my office. <laughs> no, we've uh, we, yeah. I mean, we've tried to do these things right when we do them. Yeah, hope people looks enjoy good. it. Looks good. We're gonna do that level one. Hopefully, here in a couple weeks. See how that goes. Yeah, just let us know what you need from us. We're obviously we can help, and we. Uh, as you can see, have some of the infrastructure to do so. So, yeah, we kind of we use Zoom too for our TPI lives now. So it works out well. It'd be great. Yeah, I, it's definitely the easiest platform we've done. We're we're doing a a webinar with the PG of Australia next week of all places. And they That's use cool. uh, GoToMeeting. So we just yeah, I got that. we use that platform too. But man, was it way more complicated. Yeah, yeah. This one we just got both. easy. That's right. Technology, right? Easy is the key. That's it. How long is this thing, by the way? I didn't even ask. Normally, uh, about, I'd say, 35 to 45 minutes. So, okay. you know. And you want me to, my presentation, you want it to be for how long? Like 15 minutes? 15 minutes is fine. And then we'll just get into conversation and answer questions after that point. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, generally the, the way this will go, well, I'll tell people to put questions in, in chat as we're talking, as you're kind of going through some of the material, and then Mike will feed us questions after this is done. And Sounds good. All right. So I got 100 people there already. That's good. Yeah. It seems like they always pop in right at the end, so... <laughs> right at the end. I, we had how many signups do we have, Mike? Four hundred thirty. Yeah, so that's decent. I think our biggest one that we had was maybe around seven hundred signups. Um, but yeah, four hundred thirty is not bad with crazy conditions in the world. Exactly. Okay. All right. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get this started. Okay. Ready? Ready. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot for uh, attending. I think about our 11th or 12th now super speed webinar. Well, we're really excited to talk about a topic that's been, I mean, extremely dear to my coaching career. It is junior golf training, junior golf speed training, and also extremely honored uh, to have one of my mentors in my career uh, here with us today, Dr. Greg Rose from TPI. Greg, how are you doing? I'm doing great, buddy. Thanks for having me on. Hey, we're, we're just really happy to see you. You know, hope everything's going okay out in California. I know everybody's kind of cooped up, but, you know, the world of the digital space is now, right? So. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah, so, it's perfect timing. Yeah, absolutely. I said, this is perfect so, timing. Yeah, one of the things that we've, we've done at Superspeed, you know, actually, we, we launched actually maybe about nine months after we launched our initial products, was we launched speed training products for junior golfers down through you know, five-year-olds. And it's been something that, you know, for my coaching career as a, as a golf professional, you know, I was actually, I was one of your very first 30 people certified in junior coaching. And, you know, I've been following that model with everything we've done from a coaching standpoint for a long time. And we've seen, you know, fantastic results with kids going through that process. So, you know, it's just, it's going to be great. I want to always like to introduce to our audience, you know, letting people really hear this from you know, the people that really developed it and can show everybody why it's so important. Uh, we'll talk about some of our stuff with Superspeed and how we integrated it later. But, you know, first, I'd like to turn it over to you. And if you just want to go over some of those basics of why it's so important to train some of these speed and power aspects for kids and how that works. And I just want to hand the floor over to you and sure. uh, let it go for a little bit. Sure, I'd be happy. So uh, I think, like you said, timing's perfect right now. I think we've got a lot of parents with kids stuck at home right now <laughs> wanting to Wanted to, to train and do something. So uh, again, it's an honor to spend this time with everybody. Thanks for chiming in. I'm going to switch over to a little slideshow I prepared. So I'm going to switch over so you can see my computer, hopefully, here. And 
And while Greg's switching over to the slides here too, remember, uh, please, if you have any questions, type them in the chat pane on the right. Um, we're going to be cataloging all of those, and then we'll answer all of those questions once we're done uh, with some of the presentation material here to start. Okay, so what I always like to say, and I tell my parents this, anytime uh, we're working with a child and, and the parents have questions, I, I always like to warn them, and it, it's, a, it's a good warning, but it's something I truly believe in, and that is you only have one chance to do this right. I do not believe you can go back in time. And the more we've been doing research on this, I, I feel stronger about that statement that what we're gonna talk about is, is critically important because if you miss some of these key fundamental development times, that uh, I'm not sure if you can get that at a later point in life. I'm actually pretty confident you can't. So what I'd like to do is just give you a quick overview of how to develop speed. And, and, and like I said, this is probably the most important aspect of developing speed is to get it when you're young, because that's really the time when you can do it. So I think first and foremost, if I were to ask everybody, like what are the core athletic skills that are required for golf? You know, in the past, you know, I think a lot of people thought golfers weren't athletes, but now if you look at the top 10 in the world, uh, it's a whole different ball game, right? So we've got guys like Brooks Kepka and Dustin Johnson and Rory that they look like they could play any sport. And that's because they have a pretty good athletic background or athletic skills background. And when it comes to athletic skills, I think everybody realizes for golf, you need things like mobility and strength and speed and stamina and power reaction to all, all kinds of things that all great athletes have. And, and what you need is really not a debate. I don't think most people would debate any of those things. I think what's more of the debate that we're going to talk about is, is when, like, when should you develop these things? And I, I think there's, there's all kinds of theories out there. And I'd like to start by saying there are things that we can prove and there's things that we can't prove, but we just have clinical evidence to. I'm going to talk more about the second. These are things that all we have is we have master's champions, we have money titles, we have long drive champions, we have clinical evidence. We don't have the peer reviewed evidence, um, but I think that's to come. And it's just really because it's difficult to do. You'd have to do this over a 20, 25 year period and you'd have to experiment on somebody's kids, which is very difficult. So I think the, the question that we're gonna talk about is when should you train for speed? And this is something that I think comes up in debates all the time. And, and debates like, uh, okay, let's say I've got a, uh, a seven-year-old that I'm coaching, you know, should I focus on trying to get them to hit the ball straight or should I focus on speed? Because those are two different focuses and those are two different um, goals, right? And, and not necessarily, they, they don't necessarily work together. One can actually affect the other one in a negative aspect. So what I'd like to do is try and show you some of the evidence that we have for training speed. So I always like to say, first of all, when I ask that question to parents, like when's the best time to work on developing speed? Usually they'll give me an age. They'll say like six years old or 12 years old or 14 years old. The first question I always like to show, and I like to show this video saying, take a look at these kids and I'd like you to guess who you think's the oldest, right? And this is a series of, of, of kids that uh, they all look very different, right? And I'll let it go through all of them. You guys can always pick which one, boy or girl, which color shirt you think is the oldest when you look at this whole group. And I think you can tell it's pretty wide uh, diversity of ages, at least it looks like wide diversity of ages. Some of them look really little, some of them look really tall. The question is, is which one's the oldest? Well, you probably, some of you have seen some of our stuff, probably already know the answer. And that is all of those kids were born within 30 days of each other. So they're all the same age. So I always say, is, first of all, if I ask you when you should train for speed, if you give me a, an age, well, there's already, already a problem with your answer. And that is like, this is a soccer team that I worked with in Mexico and that's the U13 team. Those are all kids on the same team, same age, right? Even though, I mean, I don't think anybody would guess that they were, they were all the same age. And this is why it's really, really difficult to use chronological age. When I ask like, hey, when should you develop speed? We don't really talk in chronological age. Chronological age is based on a calendar when you were born. We refer more to what we call developmental age, right? This is kind of how mature you are. Because the answer to that question is it really, it's about maturity of when you should develop speed, not about chronological age. Now, what do I mean? Imagine if I put a bunch of seeds in a, in a pot and I said, let's go ahead and grow these seeds. You already know this with like grass or plants, some seeds grow faster than others, right? Everybody's different. Everybody has different genetics. Everybody has different, uh, you know, uh, environment that they grow up in. So we have some kids who grow fast, some kids that grow short. And what we do is, and you've probably had this happen if you have kids and you go to a pediatrician, one of the first things that they do when you go to the doctor's office is they measure their height, right? 
And basically that, a lot of people always ask me, like, what do I, what did the doctor do with that height? Well, they actually take that and they put it into a computer. And this is something that we track all over the world of what's normal growth for kids. And what they do is they calculate something called growth velocity. And here's an example, like, let's say I took two kids, Jack and Mary, and let's say I had the one kid, we measure their height at start of year one and, and the year at, uh, at a height at year two. We do this for Jack and for Mary. And we look at those two heights. Now, what we do is we actually look at the speed at how fast they're growing, right? And you'll see that sometimes <clears throat> kids will be growing really fast and sometimes kids will be growing slow. And like you can see on the screen here, let me see if I can get my cursor here. You can see that, that this kid, Jack, he's growing pretty fast here. He's growing pretty fast and then he stops growing, levels out, and then he starts growing again, right? And what we can do is we can convert that to what we call a growth velocity curve because you can see if this is a growth velocity curve, kid's growing very fast here. Jack's growing very fast here. So we got a high growth velocity. Then he stops growing right through here. So it slows down. And then all of a sudden he starts growing again. It goes fast again. And we can convert this into what we call a growth velocity curve. And what we do is, and this is what pediatricians do, is we take the height of your child and we basically try and compare that to other kids to see how fast they're growing compared to what we know normal kids grow. So what we do is with all of our kids in our junior program, we actually take their heights every month. We take their heights, we calculate how, how tall they are. We collect a series of dates. Like let's say I took this kid's June, July, August, September, October, November, December heights. And I, I graph these plots of how many millimeters you know, per day they're growing. Then what I do is I take a normal growth velocity curve like this green curve. This is a normal curve of how fast kids are growing. And I search the curve and I try and find exactly where on this curve this child is. And, right there is where this would match. And now we know that your child is, is approximately at, at a certain point of developmental growth. And, and based on where they are and how fast they're growing, I can actually calculate what's called their biological age. So in other words, let's say I take a, a child, let's, let's, let's say I take a child that is uh, 12 years old chronologically, but I do, a, I do a growth velocity check. And I notice that they're here, they're growing really fast. And I, I look down and I go, normally kids are about 14 at this point. I say, how old is your child? You say they're 12. And I go, wow, chronologically they're 12, but developmentally they're more like 14. They're an early bloomer. Vice versa, if we have somebody who's right here and I say, how old is your child? And they say, oh, they're 16. I go, oh, well, actually they're a little late bloomer. So basically the developmental age tells me where your child is from a maturity level, not which a chronological level. So the first thing I, the first question I ask is when should you develop speed? first thing I need to know is I need to know biologically where your child is, okay? Because once I know that, these, this growth velocity curve, your biological age, helps answer that question I asked. And this is what I think we've been doing so much research on, so many Olympic federations do research on, is matching what you're working on from a skill development standpoint, whether it's power, whether it's speed, whether it's endurance, whether it's mobility, to what your developmental age is. Because we do believe that there are critical times in every child's life where you have these windows or gates. And sometimes these windows are closed and you can't develop speed as well as you can where their windows are open. And I wanna talk about some of these windows that we've identified. And we've identified at TPI 13 windows. We believe there's windows for flexibility or mobility. We think there are several, two windows for skill. We think there's two windows for speed. There's windows for stamina, strength, power, even spatial orientation or 3D integration. And I believe there are four windows that are really important for developing speed. There's two speed windows, there's a strength window and there's a power window. All of those are critically important in my mind for developing the club head speed or the ball speed that, that we're gonna try and develop with these players. And I'd like to go through those windows real quick. Now, here's the growth velocity curve I just talked about. This is North America. This is what most kids normally when they're young, let's say you're born, you're growing really fast. As you start to get older, let's say you get to seven, eight years old, you start slowing down. Then all of a sudden you'll hit your growth spurt, right? In puberty, boys, usually it's around 12, girls, it's around 10. They get to, they start growing really fast again. They get to something we call peak height velocity. That's where you're growing the fastest. And then all of a sudden you slow down. And then by the time you're old, and most people hate me when I say this, when you're 21, 22, you stop growing. That's a normal growth velocity curve. Once I know where you are and I know your developmental age, I can now look down at these windows and I can see all these different windows that open up at different times. And what you'll notice when it comes to speed, let's talk about the speed window first. It starts when you're really young. 
there's a first speed window that starts when you're really young. And then there's a second speed window that starts during your growth spurt. And I like to talk about that. This is uh, a quote from Rudy Duran. This was Tiger Woods' first coach when he was five years old. He said, the first bit of advice I always give the new students is this, hit it as far as you can. First thing I learned was to swing hard, never mind where the ball went. That's what Arnold Palmer was taught to. I think it's the right way. That's what Jack and Arnold used to do. I guess what I'm trying to say is that a lot of these, the coaches and players that were lucky realized when they were young, really young, you shouldn't focus on so much accuracy, but you should definitely focus on speed because that speed window one is so important. And that speed window one, let's see if I can move this over here. That speed window one for boys starts at around five years old. For girls, it's around four years old. Actually, believe it or not, it actually starts before that because when you're born, you're growing the fastest, but I think you need a certain level of coordination to really start working on speed. So for boys, five to eight, girls, four to seven, girls always mature faster. And then again, there's a second speed window when they hit their growth spurt in puberty, boys around 12, girls around 10. And those, those speed windows are so critically important that I always like to point this out is, I guess, just to make sure we're on the same page, I guess what I'm telling you is that if I had a seven-year-old, let's say a, a seven-year-old girl that I was giving golf lessons to, and we were at the driving range and she had a driver in her hand. What I'm telling you is that I think that's one of the most critical times to develop speed. So what I would do is I would tell her to swing that club as hard as she can. I'd say, there's a fairway, here's a driver, here's a ball, and I'll try and hit as hard as you can. If she, she swung so hard that she fell down and she hit the ball, let's say a hundred yards to the right, first of all, a hundred yards would be incredible for a seven-year-old. I would pick her up, give her a high five and say, do it again, because I knew that she created a lot of speed just to do that. Now, I know a lot of parents, coaches would be like, are you crazy? The girl fell down. She missed the fairway. But I always tell these parents or I tell these coaches, I go, listen, you really have to make a choice at this age. Uh, the choice is this. Number one, if you want to hit the ball straighter, we can do that. But I guarantee you two things will happen. Number one, I guarantee you she'll hit it straighter. We'll give her lessons and she'll coordinate. But number two is I guarantee you she'll, slow, she'll swing slower. And if you miss that window, that speed window, I'm just telling you, like I started this talk, is it's hard to go back in time. It's hard to get that speed. I think it's easy to teach them how to hit it straight later. I do not think it's easy to teach them how to hit it far later. Now, why is this? Why are these speed windows there? Well, a lot of the research will show that when you, when you grow and you're growing fast and your growth spurt at the start of your life, your bones will grow faster than the muscles. I always say, imagine you've got a bone arrow, right? The, the bow itself is the bones, the string is the muscles, right? As the kid goes through a growth spurt or is growing fast, the bone, the bow gets bigger, but the string doesn't. So what happens is the string gets put on tension. And anytime that string gets put on tension, you can now accelerate the arrow faster. This is the same thing with kids is when they get those muscles put on tension, we actually can get a little more speed out of the muscles. And I think we believe this is why we can get some incredible speed development during this time. And if you look at kids, like if you look at this boy right here, look how look at the girl here, look how flexible she is. And look at this boy, look how tight he is. But actually, if you really look at that boy closer, you'll see his elbows are actually hyper extending. He's actually hyper flexible. He's just going through a growth spurt right now. His femurs grew faster than his hamstrings. So it appears to be tight, but he's just actually going through a growth phase. And believe it or not, this kid can learn how to run faster right now. He can learn how to swing faster right now. Now you have to be careful. You don't want to pull any of these muscles, but it's really, really important to understand what's happening physiologically there. So that's the speed window. And you can see right here again, when kids are young, we're working on speed. When they get to their growth spurt, speed window two pops up. Now, a lot of people ask me like, hey, when they slow down, let's say they're not growing so fast, eight to 10, should we not work on speed? We never stop working on speed. We just don't, we don't make it the main focus of the program. When they're between five and seven, let's say for boys, speed will be a big chunk of their program, like 20, 25% of their program. When they get to their growth spurt, again, it's going to be 20% of their program. In between, it might be 5%. We never get rid of it, but we don't make it the main focus as we do during those windows. Now, uh, this is kind of some of the examples, like this is our TPI junior program here in, in Del Mar in California. And you can see these are kids just working on sprinting. People always ask, like, if you're going to do speed drills, like how... What are these drills supposed to look like? Well, what's really important, and this is Dennis McDade working on a golfer, uh, working on, on speed, racket speed, but that would also transfer into just body speed when you play golf. What's really important in speed window one, it's short bursts of speed. Most kids don't have enough fuel to maintain speeds for more than five seconds. 
as they get older in speed window two, you could probably go to 10 to 15 seconds. But anything that like, if you ask how far should these cones be apart? Well, those cones should be five seconds apart, right? That's, that's how fast uh, kids, you want them to do very short distances. Okay, so that's the speed windows. Now, what's really interesting is, is we also wanna go after strength. And we actually have multiple strength windows, but the important one that I wanna talk about is at peak height velocity. Now, if you remember when I said, here's the growth velocity curve, when a kid hits puberty, they start growing fast. Right here is peak height velocity. It's usually about 18 months into puberty. That's when you're never gonna be growing faster than that for the rest of your life. At peak height velocity, we know the strength window opens up for boys and girls. Now, a lot of researchers will tell you they think it's six months after peak height velocity for boys, and it's immediately for girls. Just so you know, at TPI and at Tiles, we actually do at peak height velocity for both boys and girls. And the reason we believe this is a strength window is this is really the first time that kids have the level of testosterone, which is a hormone that's required to develop true strength. Now you can get neurological strength. In other words, just teach your brain how to use your muscles before this. But when it comes to hypertrophy or actually building bigger muscles, uh, this is when you can really open up that window. So we always say, listen, once they get the peak height velocity, add the, the plates of weight and we go after strength. And so that's, that's our strength window right, right through here. We call it Olympic strength, right? Where we're adding uh, their, the plates or the excessive weight. And then last but not least is power. And I always like to say is there's a power window once you have speed and once you have strength, well, power is the combination of speed and strength. So once you have both those two components of power, you can put them together. Um, this is a little video and I'll kind of fast forward this a little bit, this little video of a young Peter Uline is on the PGA Tour now, uh, doing some power stuff. Here's power stuff would be like a medicine ball, right? So a medicine ball is, it adds a little external load, has some weight. And if you throw it really fast, that adds a speed component. When every time you combine speed and strength, now you're doing power. And we'll really start to exacerbate and, and load the workout program with these power exercises when they get to this age. Usually around that 15, 16 age is when we're really starting to hit power hard. And that's where you'll see a lot of that uh, it's when the fruit kind of comes to ripe that you've been working on, right? We've been working on speed one, speed two, we've been working on strength. Now we put it together into power. And I always like to say, this is a great slide that I, I wish I could show more kids and parents. And this is basically, I'm going to move my window out of here. This is basically a club head speed chart from 2008 to 2016. And this is a bunch of players here. Sergio Garcia, Dustin Johnson, Bubba Watson, J.B. Holmes, Adam Scott, Jason Day, Dave Tom, Zach Johnson, Matt Kuchar, B.J. Singh, Phil Mickelson. So I got all types of players from big hitters to short hitters. And basically what I want you to see is if I were to let's take, uh, okay, let's take, what I got here? Dave Toms. Okay, start in 2008. Here was his club hit speed. And notice as he got older, it got slower. Uh, let's take, uh, what I got here? V.J. Here's 2008. As he gets older, it gets slower. Most people get slower or maintain as they get older. There's only a couple that I could show you on this graph that actually got faster. And let's see, um, Sergio is probably an example, right? So Sergio got faster as he got older. Now, why is that? I always like to say club head speed and mainly speed and power is something you develop when you're young. Most of these players, when they get on tour, they're not young anymore. They're in their 20s, right? When you get in your 20s, most of your club head speed development has happened. Now, you can use equipment and things to help help you with your speed, but a lot of the speed development, uh, the true foundation of your speed is developed when you're young. Now, why does Sergio keep getting faster? Well, he started on tour when he was young, right? He still had time. So I, I always talk to board parents again. I'm like, listen, if you're waiting to develop speed, it's really hard. It's really, really hard when you're older. Not saying you can't, because we see it every day. We see people that... Um, uh, gain their gain speed, which is what I'm going to talk about next. But a lot of that true pure speed was developed when they were young. Now, last thing I'll say is I believe every athlete has one of four fuel types that they can use in their life, right? And these fuel types are developed again when you're young, right? I always say there's rocket fuel, which is what the biggest hitters in the world use, your long drive tour, your Bubba Watsons, you know, your Dustin Johnsons. Then there's jet fuel, which are pretty fast too. They're not as fast as rockets, but they're pretty fast. There's gasoline engines, which is, I'd say, the majority of players. And then there's diesel trucks. Those of you who just don't have a lot of speed. Now, how do I know which fuel type you are? I always like to say that, listen, uh, you can have a really fast car, but it's never going to beat a jet, right? Even a slow jet will beat a fast car. But how do I know which fuel type you are? 
Well, if you hit all four windows we talked about, you did something when you were young for speed, really young, under eight, then you did something during puberty for speed, and then you started doing some strength training in high school, and then you did some power, well, then you're probably rocket fuel, and I believe you're rocket fuel for the rest of your life. If you missed one of these windows, let's say you didn't do anything when you were really young, but you started, you know, when you were hitting puberty, you started getting into sports. Well, now you can be jet fuel. If you didn't do anything when you're young, let's say you're the captain of the debate team or the math club, not that there's anything wrong with that. You just didn't do any speed development, but you started getting into strength training, maybe in high school, maybe did a little power. All right, you can be gasoline. And then if you're like a lot of people and didn't do anything, didn't do any of this stuff when you're young, didn't really pick up anything until you're older, you're a diesel truck. Now, why is this important? I think this is critically important because I always say is that uh, if, if you had rocket fuel when you were young, this is where things like super speed and a lot of things you do in the gym are like magic. If you had, if you had rocket fuel or jet fuel when you were young and you did nothing in your 20, from 25 to 50 years old, you just went into the workforce and you stopped doing anything and you come to see me and I ask you some questions and it kind of seems like you were rocket fuel or jet fuel, we can kind of get your body to remember how to use rocket fuel and jet fuel really easy. And these players, they just, my God, their, their club head speed goes up dramatically, really quick, really fast. And they're, it's incredible to watch how you can get that rocket fuel and that jet fuel back. If you're gasoline, I always say it's 50-50. Sometimes you get huge gains. Sometimes you just get small gains. Almost everybody gets some gains, but it depends on, you know, how much, how that, how fast that car was, that gasoline car when you were doing it. And then there's the diesel trucks. And this is something that I always like to say that Listen, if you're focusing on speed training and you're noticing, like, let's say you're doing the super speed and you're only getting, let's say, two or three mile an hour increase, which is still, that's good. But some people are getting 10 mile, 15 mile increase. It could be because you're a diesel truck. And if you didn't do anything when you were young, don't expect to be rocket fuel when you're old. You can still get a little faster. But if you really try and get to the point where you're like, I'm going to kill myself until I get 15 more miles an hour, most diesel trucks just break down. So you got to be really careful that you don't try and become a rocket. So again, I always like to warn everybody, I believe most of this development is done when you're young. You wanna try and turn your kids into rocket fuel and jet fuel. You only got one chance to do this right. Uh, I'll, I'll finish my slideshow with, uh, you can see the differences between boys and girls. Again, everybody's growing fast when they're young. And then basically girls tend to hit their growth spurt earlier and then boys maybe two years after. But understanding where your child is developmental age and understanding what you should attack at those different times is one of the key principles to most Olympic development programs out there. And it's what we're doing with some of the biggest hitters in the world in golf right now. And if you take advantage of these critical windows, I think you're gonna get a lot of success. Okay, so that that's a quick, I'll stop that, a quick little synopsis of speed in the windows. No, I thought that was, Awesome, Greg. And I mean, obviously, I've, I've worked with some of this stuff and seen it before. Like, I, I can't even reiterate enough how important it is for parents out there to really get that idea across that, you know, the goal here is not producing necessarily the best seven or eight year old golfer in the world. It's to give those kids the potential, the athletic potential and, you know, the athletic, the athletic goods, if you will, to become an elite athlete in their late teens, early 20s. Or hell, I mean, I would say even to become an elite athlete, any sport they want at that point. You know, most most of our PGA Tour players did not commit to just golf until the age of 14 or 15. They were all multi-sport athletes in almost every sport, baseball, tennis, same way, is that if you miss those athletic skill development windows, it's hard to become an elite player later. So if you feel like you're just going to early specialize when you're young and you don't get those athletic skills, I uh, actually, we, Istvan Bali, one of our advisory board members who does a lot of this says early ripe equals early rotten, right? And that's mm -hmm. that early ripe, early rot is so common with kids who early specialize. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree. And, you know, I think we do end up coaching, you know, out in the, out in the general world of dealing with your amateur golfers too. You, know, you do end up coaching a lot of players that are in those lower kind of speed levels, right? We're, we're dealing with a lot of those gasoline type players and some of those diesel players. And now I, that is one of those things too, where a lot of those people over the course of their life have had a lot of different things they've tried to do. And, in, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of those neurological limiters still on their speed. So it is possible yeah. to see some pretty big gains from those people still. It's just like, absolutely. This like, like I said, there, uh, right? yeah. like it's just hard, right? Yeah, like I said, on the diesel truck, you're still going to get gains. Most people are going to get gains. And by the way, like three mile an hour, four mile an hour club speed gain on a diesel truck seems like 20 miles an hour to some of the rockets, right? It seems like Absolutely. a big deal. And, and a lot of times, uh, you know, if you combine that with 
some instruction, obviously golf instruction helped them get the club face better and some equipment fitting. It can be, I mean, it can be 30 yards, 40 yards for these players. Yep. Yeah. I just wanted to reiterate there. It's like, don't, it's not discourage. It's one of those things that if you're already there and you don't have it, I don't want to discourage people, but at the same time, like if you're a parent and you have kids at home, give them every chance you possibly can to let them make that own choice for themselves later in life and be an explosive asset that they want to be. Cool. 100%. Well, Mike, we got some questions, I'm sure, on this. Why don't we start uh, looking at a couple of those? We're happy to answer some of this. I saw a bunch of chat stuff popping up through the course of it. So, Yeah, for sure. So the first question I have here is for Greg from Kevin. Based upon your presentation, is it too late for a nine-year-old to develop speed? So great question, Kevin. So just to kind of reiterate what I said, remember, there are th four main in windows for developing ultimate speed, right? Uh, the, the second window doesn't start till puberty, right? So if it's a boy, you know, most kids chronologically somewhere around 12, girls somewhere around 10 is until they really hit their second speed window. So you still have speed window too, you still have strength window and you still have power window to come. So they can become uh, jet fuel, which is pretty fast, right? Uh, it's just if they missed that first one when they were really young, then I believe it's hard to make them rockets, but I'll take a jet. That's pretty fast. It's, not, it's yeah, never too late at night. Just to add to that a little bit too, Greg, like the other thing too you got to think about is that the things that they might have been doing when they were five to seven years old in that range, you know, if they were out running and jumping and climbing stuff and doing that, a lot of times they accidentally worked on a lot of speed and power things that may not have been purposely trained. Yeah, so I, think that, I think that's really important. I'm not talking about swinging clubs, right? So I, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is when you're young, you can work on speed. Like I showed you uh, sprinting. So if, you, if the kids like went played tag when they were young and, and ran around and they played soccer or they did karate or they did something to develop that, that nervous system to go faster, you're good to go, right? That's, that's kind of really, really important. Absolutely. And the other thing too to say, I think is that it's important is that the best time to start working on speed with a kid is right now. Like it doesn't, you know, get 100%. it going. Like the, it, too late is it's never, it's too late if you will, to maybe become a rocket fuel, but it, the, the best time to start doing it is, is immediately. And we didn't really talk about genetics. Obviously genetics have a lot to do with this too, but if, if you actually train properly, you can actually beat somebody with better genetics, right? And when I say genetics, better fast twitch fibers, things like that. So training is so important to be able to influence this. Uh, to that point, Greg, Ray has a question about what kind of workouts you could do, especially right now, given the current climate. What's some, what would be some of the options that they could do for training speed? Sorry, can you say that? One, you broke up on me on the first part. Can you say that one more I, time? I got it, Greg. He was, he was asking what type of workouts or what kind of things could people do with their kids right now when they're kind of cooped up in their house to work on speed? Right. right. Got one. Okay. Go ahead. You go first. Well, super speed <laughs> golf, of course. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. No, go ahead. Yeah, no, so there, like I said, the key to developing speed when, if we're talking about speed window one, young kids, is keeping the activity under five seconds. So if you say, you know, let's go play catch in the backyard and you're going to throw a ball as hard as you can. Perfect. Doesn't take more than five seconds to throw a ball. If you say you're going to kick, kicking is an explosive activity. It's less than five seconds. If you're going to have them do sprinting and you say, okay, let's go for a a quarter mile sprint. Well, of course that's more than five seconds and that actually can make them slower. So you want short bursts of speed. So interval stuff, throwing, kicking, striking, of course, swinging, anything that allows them, like if you have really young kids, you know, get a balloon or get one of those bubble machines and give them a little, like a, a one of those tubes that come with a wrap, wrapping paper and say, try and hit every one of the bubbles before they get on the ground. Short ballistic jumping activities are great. Um, uh, all of those, I mean, there's a million ways to develop speed. Yeah, no, we actually do it with a bubble machine. So I have a, I have a two and a half year old at home. So yeah. um, we actually give her like a paper towel roll, put the bubble machine up on like our little loft that oversets our, our family room. So set the bubbles out into the family room and just let her go to town. She loves it. Yeah. I love, I love activities like karate, striking, kicking. Um, I, I love uh, any, any type of jumping or sprinting, as long as they're short little interval sprints. Um, I think even like going both directions, sprinting forward, sprinting backwards is really important. We didn't really talk about developing both sides, but swinging left, swinging right, throwing right, throwing left, striking left, striking, all of those are really important. 
Yeah, our super speed golf community is well versed on non-dominant training. So I'm sure um, there is, if, if you go to our website and you look at our uh, super fun protocol. So basically our, our protocol for that first speed window and that five to seven developmental age. I mean, you're not going to see the same stuff that you see for our adult protocols. Like we basically right. say, look, take the green club swing as fast as you can. I don't care if you do it right-handed or left-handed, but take a couple swings, which takes less than five seconds. And then here, let's go do a squat jump. And then let's go do this with this other club and then let's go do a sprint. Like it's just so you, everyone knows here, like this is exactly where all of those protocols came from is this philosophy of of helping. Basically it, what we're saying is common sense. The problem is most people, kids today, their, their thumbs get really fast, you know, at at playing games on their phone, but they just don't develop anything else. We're just saying, let's go back to old school and just have kids go out and play. Absolutely. We've had a lot of questions, Greg, uh, specifically about how to do it. Basically explaining to them, you know, with the coach, what the kid is trying to achieve. So do you have any uh, suggestions for how you can basically get the coach and the parent on the same page in terms of developing speed throughout the career through different activities? Yeah, I, I, again, I don't know why you broke up, but I think I got the gist of that. But I think you said, how do I, if the coach or the parent aren't thinking the same thing or, or fighting with each other, how do we get them on the same page? Is that the question? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So normally, uh, you know, it's it's a coach, a trained coach will do something and the parent will say, hey, this, is, this doesn't smell like normal golf instruction. I don't understand. Uh, you know, why are we doing all these stupid things? This has nothing to do with golf. And my kid's got to get a scholarship. And, you know, all, the same things happen over and over again. And, and I get it because the whole world has been, has been programmed to, I have to early specialize to get a, uh, a scholarship. And again, here's the problem with everything we're saying is potentially the parents right that if you don't early specialize, a college coach might not think you're good enough and might not draft you. But the evidence, Evidence is very strong in showing that the things that you do to early specialize that might help you become a better 12 year old hurts you at winning the masters. So it's a really, it's a big dilemma right now for parents of like, what do I do? Do I want my kid to win the U13 championship, which by the way, nobody knows who won the U13 championship and nobody cares who won the U13 championship. Usually those kids don't become anything. It's very rare when they, when they actually go on is if you're going to early specialize and go after the youth championship to get a scholarship, just I always let my parents know that potentially what we have to do will prevent them from getting to the highest level of golf. So if the goal is just to get a college scholarship, I might agree that there are some things that we might want to early specialize in and do, but I also know that probably not going to end up, you know, working with that player on the PGA tour or the LPGA. Now, you know, how can I get the best of both worlds? Right now, it's very difficult. I would tell you that if you're going to go after both, if you're going to go after getting the golf skills and the athletic development skills, well, now that's a lot of training, right? So it's about how much hard work they want to put in. Because if you, as long, if you put in the athletic skill development and the golf development, you're talking a lot of hours every day. And there are players all over the world that are doing that, right? Um, I would say maybe their grades are suffering a little bit and some of the other education, but it's, it's a real big problem right now. Um, of answering that question, but I, I don't want to lie to you and say, oh, listen, if you just do athletic skills and minimize your golf, that everything's going to be okay, you might bloom later. The problem is, is the kids that bloom later, like like Michael Jordan, right? Or, you know, if I just go down the list of the greatest athletes, you know, almost all of them bloomed later. They didn't bloom early. So uh, it, it's a tough one. And I, I understand the debate. So I, I always tell my coaches that the parents are arguing, I explained to them what I started with. There's only one chance to do this right. If you want them to have the speed of a Brooks Kepka or Dustin Johnson, then we need to develop it now. We can't go back in time. And if we, if we do, I always say, you know, if I do give them lessons to keep the ball in the play and make it look like a better golf, golfer, well, then it's going to cost you speed. And just so you know, from somebody who does a lot of scouting, right, let's say, you know, we're going to try and draft somebody, you know, let's say at, at, uh, do a sponsorship in golf. And you gave me two options. I had two 14 year olds. I had a 14 year old right now that is probably the number one 14 year old in the country. Never played any other sport, just played golf. It's a, they're just a little machine. They look like a little Brooks Kepka. They don't have a lot of power, but they just hit it straight. 
and a great putter. And then you give me this other kid who's just one of the best athletes at 14, was an incredible hockey player, played tennis, never played golf, but it's one of the most explosive athletes I've ever seen. There's no question I'll take the second one, not the first one, because I believe I can teach them how to be a golfer. And once they develop the skills that the golfer has now and, and an athlete with golf skills meets a golfer, the game's over. The athlete wins every time. Yeah, I, I would reiterate that too. We did a lot of um, collegiate prep type programs at our academy in Chicago where we would have players come in and we would build out their whole portfolios of track man data and all the different things that they would be sending off to colleges to look at getting scholarships and working on getting recruited. And every college coach that I talked to in 10 years in Chicago across the entire country, the number one thing that all of them wanted was ball speed. If you give them a player with ball speed, they're, they're pretty much, they're happy to work on every other aspect of skill with a player that's already got 180 mile an hour ball speed, you know, give them a player that has 150, 560 mile an hour ball speed. And they're looking at you like you're crazy. They can't can't compete anymore. And that's the problem. That's the key problem is that um, speed has just been proven. It's where you end up on the money list. It's where you end up on the world rankings. And if you don't have it, but you have all these great golf skills, we're just not going to look at you. I mean, the same things in baseball. We have a kid that's an incredible pitcher that can maneuver the ball and strike people out and you can throw the ball at 85, 88 miles an hour. I'm sorry. No team's looking at you unless you're in the nineties when you're in high school. Now it's just, it yeah. doesn't matter. Command doesn't matter. Power does. Yeah. It was, it was always the most disappointing cases and, and the hardest ones that we struggled with when we were in the, in the thick of this training. Some of these kids were those, those kids that came in and they were 13, 14 years old and they were excellent 13, 14 year old golfers. And they just, couldn't get past the next level. It was like all of a sudden the athletes are starting to catch up to them and they're feeling it. And they just, there's nothing you can really do at that point. It's very difficult. Yeah. I I can present you some of the data, but it's like, you know, back, you know, like 2016, I believe we had 44, 45 players that could hit a ball over 170 miles an hour. Today we have a hundred of the 125. Right. So it's just, if you can't hit like, if you can't get 170 mile an hour ball speed, you're just, you're just a, you can't give Brooks Kepka, Dustin Johnson, Rory, you can't give them a two club advantage. They're going to beat you every time. Yep. And it's only getting worse too. Like it's just, oh, I, yeah. personally, I believe the next five years, what you're going to see on tour is that whole thing's just going to keep creeping up. Like yeah. what we've yeah. seen is that the, the, the maximum ball speed or, or yeah, ball speed, let's say is around 185 right now. Like obviously there's a couple guys, Cameron, some ones that can get a little bit higher, but we're not seeing a ton of players going past that we just see way more players being able to do that. You know what I mean? So that's the thing. Yep. Awesome. Mike, what else we got? So hopefully you can hear me this time, but basically there've been a lot of questions around TPI level two in terms of junior and golf, um, as well as just uh, non golf related activities. So if you guys could talk a little bit further about, um, the specific levels of TPI, but also some of the things that you would recommend, especially as juniors are developing, if they should be a little bit more focused at a certain time of their career or not. A lot of questions around that specifically. Okay, so um, let's let's see. So that's a, obviously let me give I give you a quick overview of of the TPI program. So obviously we do a TPI. Everybody comes to level one. Level one is basically the body swing connection, understanding how to screen somebody and identify how their body's affecting their golf swing. Once you get TPI certified, then you can go into our specialty tracks and we have a junior specialty track. And I'm proud of a lot of things we've done, but I'm probably the most proud of our junior track in that we basically took some of the smartest minds around the world in developing athletes and developing golfers. And we developed a 13 year curriculum on what to do with the kids starting at age five for boys, age four for girls, and what to do all the way till college. So in other words, we're gonna show you what we would do for 13 years every week for 13 years and go through those windows and how we progress them and what to do. And that's, that's kind of our junior track. And the level two is an online program. And then we have a three day live level three. We got uh, guys, Dennis McDade, who's the head of our coaching, our junior coaching and Milo Bryant, head of our conditioning kind of are the the leaders of that whole track and it's pretty special it's pretty cool and I always feel like once you have a curriculum it's kind of like if you're going to develop math well of course you know you have a progression of how you do math I just see out there in the world today most golf coaches or parents they they don't have a curriculum they just guess on what they should be doing but they'll be like let's go do calculus and I'm like you haven't even learned how to do addition yet what do you mean 
So just like junior golf, you should have a curriculum. So we give you a curriculum and then you can take that and use it to copy and create your own. So that's our junior program. And then, um, you know, uh, other question on that is like, what are, what are some of the, the, you said some of the other sports that, I'm sorry. So the first question was an overview of TPI. And what was the second part of that question? Within uh, TPI, how much of the program is developed around non-golf activities? Oh, okay, sure, sure, yeah. So, so I think, you know, when we start out, we, we kind of put kids in phases, right? We have the young kids we call fundamental stage, and then they, they kind of advance to, we have like four different golf schools that they go through. In the first golf school, which we, uh, our, our, we call it the Cyclone, is our first golf school. I would say that probably 60% of the program is non-golf based. It's more athletic based because at that point in time, we're trying to develop all these athletic skills and fundamental movement skills and fundamental sports skills. Then what we didn't talk about is we didn't talk about what happens after that first speed window. Remember growth velocity is really high when you're young and then you get to like eight years old for boys, nine years for girls, it starts to, or seven for girls, it, it starts to slow down. Well, when you're not growing fast is a great time to work, to work on skill. So that's when we start giving tons of instruction. And if you looked at our second golf school, which is called our smash school, which is between like eight and 12 for boys and seven, 10 for girls, you're going to see it flips. We almost have 60% of it on golf instruction, but we still are still developing the athlete. Then once we get into the growth spurt and basically the growth spurt, the whole body goes through a complete metamorphosis and kids go through this wild ride of hormones and nervous system, and cardiovascular system. And we call that the wave because your body is kind of going through this wave of emotions and physical development. And in that wave school, it, it's pretty equal. We're about 50-50 because there's all kinds of things that are happening physiologically that we need to address. And, and we also get skill regression at that time because when you start growing fast, all of a sudden it's hard to walk, and let alone be coordinated. So we do a lot of stuff of practice and deliver practice to maintain your skills. So you'll see our practice volumes go up. And then once you get past the wave, let's say, you know, you get to 12 years old for boy, you know, or I'm sorry, 14 for boy, 12 for girl, we move into either one of two programs. We have a, what we call a golf for life program, which is I, I'm going to go be an attorney or a lawyer or a doctor, I'm sorry, attorney and a lawyer, those are the same thing. So if I'm going to be a doctor or attorney, I, I, I just want to, I want to love golf. We go into this golf for life program where our volumes are pretty low and most of our focus is on golf. And most of it's on, on playing golf and, and tournament play and, and you know, uh, course management. And obviously, skill progression is still on there. If, if you it's like, no, I actually really, really love golf. And I think I'd like to do this in college or I'd like to do this professionally. Well, then we have what's called our EDP program. It's our elite development program. When we get to our elite development program, we probably have more golf than most programs. Heavy golf instruction. We obviously, of course, are still developing power and all that stuff. But probably leaning more towards 80% golf development. And uh, our volumes get pretty high because we want to get to, we're going to show them what it would take to become a PGA or an LPGA player. That's kind of how we break it down. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the, uh, the big picture level of it too is it's extremely important to look at that these programs are geared at what ages these kids are. So they're optimally fun, if you will, for kids that are five years old to go to this golf program. Um, and then it's optimally fun, I think, and, and intense for somebody that's 16, 17 year old and wants to play in college. It's giving them the tools they need. So balancing that out around what these kids are going to need to have fun while they're in there, I think it's probably one of the big points as well. Did that answer that, Mike? Yep, that's perfect. What else we got? So we've had a lot of questions um, specific to individuals looking for uh, some different exercises around which they can develop speed. Um, Mike, could you talk about anything specific within our program? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, we've kind of split our super speed training out over different age groups as well. Um, so there's a lot of that information on our website that you can check out. You know, I also think that there's a, a wealth of knowledge on TPI's website as well. You can see at mytpi.com can also go on there and actually find these certified professionals in your area that can really help you walk your kids through these programs in the best way. So, um, you know, it's hard to give a generalization of actually, do you want me to show you? these exercises for everybody, but you know, I'm sure Greg could probably add some good stuff in here. I'll tell you what, I can do this. Let me, uh, let me go back to sharing my screen, share my screen real quick. And 
I can show you for you guys that are interested. If I go to, let's go to TPI and just so you can kind of see this. I don't think that's shared, oh. Greg. Whoops, just whoops, let me do that one more time. Sorry, let me do that one more time. I'll kind of show you where you can get the junior exercises because I think that's what everybody's asking. Okay, let's see, go back to Zoom and share. And share. Tell me if that goes live there. Can there you see go. it? Okay. So if you go to mytpi.com, go to improve my game. Under improve my game, you can come down and see drills and exercises. Under drills and exercises, we have a tab that says juniors, and you'll see all kinds of ac activities and exercises. You can also go to this advanced filter. Under advanced filter, you can look up different types of categories, right? Like I can go on speed, right? Or I can put in power. Right, you can click on those and go to go. And now it's gonna search all of our library of speed and power activities. And it'll just go pages and pages and pages of fun athletic and golf skill development stuff. So that's kind of a quick way where you can see from our website. It's an incredible resource. If you guys haven't checked that website out, um, I mean, there's so much information. These guys spend so much time recording videos, putting up new drills and exercises. I, I think. A lot of people, you know, once they get onto that and start checking it out, I mean, just blown away by the amount of information that's there. Yeah, there's some cool stuff on there for sure. I do see an, another question, Mike. I don't know if somebody said, uh, what other sports do you like for kids? And, and I, I love, I think this is a good question. Is I Obviously, I love any striking sport, right? So from baseball to tennis to racquetball, badminton, squash, anything that gives hand-eye coordination and swinging and implement fast, I think is incredible. Um, I think anything that uh, does any type of throwing, like that's why like baseball pitchers, quarterbacks tend to be great golfers, same type of way of generating power and transferring power. I love track and field. So any of the throwing from javelin to shot to hammer to the sprinting, all that helps develop speed. And then one that a lot of people don't really think about, I said badminton, uh, but I even table tennis like or ping pong, just understanding spin and control the golf ball. It's amazing on how many great golfers are great ping pong players as well too. Yeah, I think everybody should have a badminton net in their backyard and a ping pong table in their basement. That's a I recipe agree. for an elite golfer for sure. I agree. To further well, that- Anything else pressing, Mike, we wanna get hit? I was gonna say one follow-up to that point, how often should people focus on training for speed, especially during these windows? Yeah, so I, I always like to say that, you know, if, if, that, if you're in a window, I always like to make that at least a 25% focus. So 75% of the time I can go work on other stuff, but I just want to make sure that that's a big piece of your puzzle of, of when you're adding in your volume, right? So now with that said, you also have to watch your volumes because if you get to the point where you're tired, when well, you're not developing speed, you're actually getting slower. So, you know, it, it's one of those things where it depends on how much volume you can handle, but it is like, that's why I love using the speed monitors with super speed is that you can see the, the club head speed getting faster. And as soon as it starts to go down, well, then their fuel tanks are low and stop. You can pick it up again in a couple of days, but make sure you're focusing on this uh, with every training session. When they're, If you're doing three training sessions per week with the young kid, then I'd be including something for speed on each one of those sessions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I completely agree. Nothing to add there. All right. Well, I, I think actually that probably wraps up the majority of those questions that we had. Um, I think we'll go ahead and probably just cut it off there, Greg. Um, we really okay. appreciate everybody spending some time with us today. Uh, we, you know, extremely, we're extremely thankful, Greg, for coming on and uh, hanging out with us here for this afternoon. You know, we hope everybody, uh, we, we hope everybody, you know, stays safe in this incredibly odd time we're in right now, you know, stay at home and, uh, you know, it's a great time when you're stuck at home to do some super speed golf training. So, Check that out as well. So if you want any more information on uh, all the stuff that Greg does with TPI, uh, that website is mytpi.com and uh, at mytpi on social media. Obviously, you know where to find us at superspeedgolf.com and at superspeedgolf all over social media. Um, beyond that, again, thanks again, Greg, for coming on and seeing and, and hanging out with us. Um, sure, we'll catch up again soon. It's my pleasure. Stay safe, everybody. Love you guys. See you guys. All right. Bye. Bye.